today we're going to be talking about uh, conceptions of virtue in Aristotle and in contemporary positive psychology. Uh, it's obviously absurd to think about talking about Aristotle's ethics in one part of one class. <laughs> I took an entire graduate seminar on Aristotle's ethics with Miles Bernier when I was a grad student, and I think we made it through books one, two, and part of six and part of seven <laughs> in the entire seminar. So um, I don't pretend that we're going to really be able to give anything like a comprehensive picture of Aristotle on ethics or even Aristotle on virtue. What I do want to say is that there are a couple of things in Aristotle that I think we can pick out that are important independently of a lot of the other details of his particular theory. So let's take a look at what a couple of those things are. He starts out by saying every art, every action, every inquiry is aimed at some good. Therefore, the good is that at which all things aim. And if this were a seminar of ethical theories would examine that little inference, point out that it seems outrageously fallacious, <laughs> and then try to figure out how are these getting from that premise to the conclusion. But for now, I want to say he's raising an issue there that is actually extremely important and that we need to think about whenever we think about virtue or character strengths more broadly. Because what's at stake here? We're really thinking about virtue or character strength. And we're thinking, well, what exactly are we aiming at? Okay? Suppose you go to the gym <coughs> and you talk to a trainer and you say, train my body. Okay? What's the first thing they're going to ask you? What do you want? Right? Do you want to lose weight? Do you want to get bigger muscles? Do you want to improve your aerobic fitness? What exactly are you looking for? What's your goal? And so if you think about strength, well, it's strength for what? There are different things you might want to do. And so similarly, if we think of a virtue as a kind of strength of character, we say, well, strength for what caps? What is its purpose? What is its goal? So virtue is something that ought to have some goal. It's directed at something. And one way of looking at this is to say, not only what are virtues good for, but also if we're trying to think of what the virtues are, we have to think, well, what are they supposed to do? So let's think about that for a moment. Suppose we say, yeah, we want people to be good. We want them to be virtuous. Why? What's our purpose in seeking virtue? Social stability. Ooh, social stability might be one answer. So we could say, yeah, look, there's something essentially social about this. And that's something the positive psychologists are going to come back to and stress. But it's also there in Aristotle. In the end, he says, really, this is a branch of political science. At a first glance, that seems surprising. But what he means is we're talking about strengths that are geared toward the good of the individual, but he says also in a broader sense, the good for man. That is to say, the good for humanity, the good for all of us living together, the good for the entire group, for the community. And so there is going to be something fundamentally social as well as individual, right? We want something that says, look, strength of character is going to help you. It will also help all of us. Now, what else might we be interested in? Or specifically, you might say, within this social group, you mentioned stability, individuals. What are we looking for for individuals and for communities? Yeah? Maybe like some fulfillment. Ah, good. So we might say, yeah, what exactly is this for either one? Well, you've already mentioned stability. That's true at the individual level as well as the social level. You don't want somebody who's going to fall apart easily. You also want fulfillment. Okay, you want to feel fulfilled as a human being. You want the community to be, in some sense, fulfilled. What would that mean, actually, for either an individual or a community? What is fulfillment? Yeah, not needing to ask a question. <laughs> not, not needing to ask a question? Ah, well, Aristotle does say at one point that what we're looking for should be complete, in the sense that it is the good for mankind. Okay? And so once you've got that, it's like nothing else really matters. It's kind of like you've got this, you're fulfilled, and now somebody says, hey, how about fulfillment plus? And you don't need it. 
Now, that's not, now look, I, sometimes I look at this and I think, I don't get it, Aristotle, because after all, I'm fulfilled. But then you say, but how about an ice cream cone? So, yeah, that's good. Okay. <laughs> so, you might think, wait, the fulfillment isn't complete. It's like, I can, things can get, get better and better and better. But I think his view is, look, you've got enough. Your life is complete without it. And so, if somebody offers you some additional good thing, you think, well, that'd be fine, but, but whatever, right? If somebody, like, I drive, I like actually driving old cars. And so I have a 2000 Miata and a 2002 Jetta. And I'm happy with them. And if one doesn't work, I drive the other. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the moment they both work, the one isn't legal because the check engine light won't go off. But don't tell anybody at the DMV. <laughs> but anyway, um, you know, it's like if somebody came along and said, here's a new BMW. Yeah. Yeah, I'm fine without it. I don't really need it. And so it's supposed to be complete. It is supposed to be the kind of thing that once you're fulfilled, you don't ask any more questions. You don't really need anything else. Now, if it's supposed to be in some sense then complete, what else can we say about this? All right. I, I'm seeing, I might be seeing a problem here. Okay. Um, if, if I can spell the comment. Sure. Okay, good. Um, so, if, if virtue is always aiming towards something, um, and always pursuing a goal, it seems a bit ambitious, but it also seems that ambition and fulfillment are hard to have at the same time, because if you're really focused on advancing yourself in some way, or doing something, you're not exactly fulfilled with your lot that you have within. Where are I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good, good, good. Um, you might think, wait, completeness is going to be compatible with certain kinds of virtues, right? But maybe incompatible with some others. And there are a couple of questions that I think that raises. One is, is this sort of count actually compatible with the list of virtues that Aristotle comes up with, or that we would want to come up with? For example, suppose you think ambition is a virtue. Then you're going to say, oh, I don't know. If I'm fulfilled, how ambitious am I? If I'm feeling like my life is complete, how ambitious am I? Um, now, actually, the way Aristotle uses the term, and I think, to some extent, this is the usage of ambitious has changed a little bit over time. Um, he says, this is one of those cases where actually the virtue has no name. If you say somebody is unambitious, that's a criticism. But if you say he's ambitious, that sounds like a criticism too, um, or it can. Now I think it sounds like that to a lot less to our ears. But when W. D. Ross was translating Aristotle's Ethics at first in 1908, ambitious still had a really negative ring to it. Think about um, Shakespeare, Julius Caesar, uh, Mark Antony's speech, uh, where he's talking, ah. You know, Brutus says he has ambitions, and surely he is an honorable man. And the whole claim, the whole complaint against Caesar is he was ambitious. Well, that's not meant to be a good thing, right? It's like, yeah, he just got his own VA, he was looking to rise in the company <laughs> of the Roman Republic or something. No, I mean, it's like, no, this was a bad thing, seeking power for its own sake, and, or for, for selfish reasons. And, um, and anyway, in the translation, the idea is, yeah, that kind of ambition is bad. On the other hand, whether we have a term for it or not, but I think ambitious has been migrated to be that virtue term for us instead of the negative thing. There's, there's so many noises around today. People have been criticizing these YouTube videos that I've been putting up there because of the noise um, and because they say I need a better microphone, which I've been investigating. But basically, I went in today thinking, I think I know what to do. And the guy said, no, no, no. I need this thousand dollar setup. Uh, I'll live with this for a little while. <laughs> but anyway, um, the thought is, yeah, I mean, ambition, let's, whatever that virtue is, whether we talk to term ambitious or not, there is this sense of, look, wanting to achieve, right? The desire for achievement seems to us pretty important as a virtue. And is that compatible with the idea that it's all about ultimately? Fulfillment about a complete life. 
Well, here is Aristotle's answer, I think. All of this is summed up in one thing. <laughs> Reminds me of the line from City Slickers, where Jack Palance's character says, it's all about one thing. And Billy Crystal says, what's that one thing? Of course, that is very disappointing. Well, that's for you to find. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's like, yeah, that's all I got. We're going to be deep, but not that deep. Now, Aristotle thinks, yeah, it is ultimately about one thing, namely happiness. Okay? So all of these things get labeled happiness. Now, there's a sense in which that is misleading. Because our English term happiness has to do with how you're feeling. And so you might think happiness levels rise and fall with your mood. For example, today it's sunny. Last week it was just gloomy day, right? And so you might think, yeah, I feel a lot happier today. Why? The sun is shining, the grass is green, you know, all that kind of thing. Um, my last year in Pittsburgh, the entire month of March, it rained. I mean, it poured for 20 days straight. We were talking about building parks. <laughs> it was that bad. And people were so gloomy, they were so grumpy, right? And it's not that our lives had gotten that much worse. It was just that, okay, you respond to that kind of thing. And in English, happiness is sensitive to that. Aristotle's term really isn't. In fact, he says, ideally, I'm talking about something that applies to a complete life, okay? And it's something much broader than just how you're feeling at a given moment or a given day. It has to do with living well. And so for him, happiness is a matter of living well, succeeding in life, okay? <laughs> Flourishing is the way it's often represent. Brian, I have a friend who, when he greets me, um, I mean, we don't see each other often, but occasionally we run into each other at a philosophical conference, and he always says, Daniel, are you flourishing? <laughs> okay, and that's, that's because he's an Aristotelian, <laughs> but this is what he's referring to. And that idea, are you living well? Is your life going well? Are you flourishing? That's, that's a different question, right, from how you feeling today? <laughs> and happiness feels a little bit more like that, how are you feeling today? This is something bigger, this is a broader question. So now, can ambition be part of a life that is being lived well, where you're flourishing? Okay, I see some people nodding, yes, others nodding no. <laughs> Give me the argument that it can be. Yeah. Uh, in his book on this topic, uh, David Brooks, in The Road to Character, uh, says that you can't achieve virtue or character if you're aiming for it, which made me think, then why am I reading this book? Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, yes, but, uh, so, I, if, if you're aiming for happiness or well-being, which I think is a, the word that best fits how you're talking about it. Good, um, well-being is another yeah. common translation. Uh, the, the case has been made that it, it, the aiming for it is what makes it go away, and it's through facing tough odds and tough circumstances to actually achieve a deeper form of flourishing. Okay, good. You might think, yeah, look, flourishing, well being, and so on, isn't a matter of just vegging out. Uh, I used to play a video game where at the end of the game, if you won, this grand chord would sound, and this light would flash and stay on the screen, which is like, boom. Right? And it's, it's, this talk of completeness and fulfillment can suggest your life has reached that boom, boom, boom. <laughs> But it's not like that, right? A thriving plant is one that's growing, changing. It's not just going boom. <laughs> and so you might think, wait a minute, no, I mean, you're right. I mean, insofar as you strive for this as just an end where, okay, that's it. Nothing more changes, nothing more happens. That's not only not going to work, but that's going to lead you to frustration. It's really a matter of growing and, and so on that's part of flourishing. Yeah. And I'd say, yeah, if you don't have passion or drive or motivation, we generally say, hey, you should see someone. I think you might be depressed. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, really, somebody who's in this state of stasis, we tend to think something's wrong. Right? Perhaps they're depressed, or perhaps they are unambitious, or perhaps they are you know, stuck in a rut, Groundhog Day, uh, <laughs> right, where Bill Murray's character says, uh, you know, gosh, what if you were in the same place day after day doing the same thing and nothing mattered? The guy's 
drinking Massachusetts. That about sums it up for me. <laughs> uh, that's a bad thing, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, after you, like, without, with the absence of condition or passion or stuff like that, once you reach completeness, what else is there? Like, what do you do the day after? After that, we still complete, and that without having anything else to reach for it in, in the, of itself, you know. That's right, exactly. I mean, what what happens the day after that? It's like I've got everything I ever wanted. Now what, right? And in the stories, oh, they live happily ever after. But it's like, well, what do they do? <laughs> and this is a real thing. You can orient yourself towards certain goals, and then you reach those goals. Like right now, it might be graduation. And so, yeah, I want to graduate. You can't wait, right? You imagine that day when the degrees are conferred and toss your hat in the air and say, like, yes! And then you wake up the next morning, it's like, it's not that same yet. It's not like the rest of your life is like, yeah, I graduated! <laughs> right? I don't bounce out of bed every morning and say, yes, I graduated! And, um, you got to go on to the next thing. And, you know, that kind of thing can be sort of frustrating. Now, how do you do it? I remember when I first got to UT, I was trying to get tenure. I got tenure, actually very young, when I was just 29. And I remember talking to a friend of mine in business school about this. And I said, you know, it's, it's actually weird. Because so much of my life has been oriented toward this over the last several years, that now that I've gotten it, like, I was faced with that problem. Well, now what? Right? And I felt like now it's in a way a harder problem because there I felt as if there was a hurdle that they had put for me and I had to jump over the hurdle. But now it's kind of like, well, it's up to me to make my own hurdles and to set my own goals. So what am I going to do about that? She said, oh, you don't have to set your own goals. Just ask, what do they require for me to become a professor? And then what do they require for me to become an endowed chair? And then to become professor emeritus and all I thought, well, that's crummy. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> notice what she's saying. Like, somebody else always sets the goals. You just have to jump over the hurdles the other people set. And I thought, I don't want to live my life that way. Uh, and so, for most of us, actually, it's like it seems to me weird actually to just say, oh, other people tell me what to do, and I just do it. You know, I say they say jump, I say how high. <laughs> uh, that's not the way we live. So at some point, it does involve, I think, not only ambition and striving for something, but setting your own goals, deciding what your aims are, initiating your own projects and so forth. And just always doing what somebody else is telling you to do seems like a crummy way to live. Later, Kant is going to refer to that as heteronomy. Just other people give you the rules and you follow them. And Kant says that's not really characteristic of human beings. That's all that gives us dignity. It's making up the rules for ourselves and setting our own goals. Now, this idea that things are sort of geared toward one thing, at first glance seems pretty bold. Really, just one thing. But it's meant to be comprehensive. It's got all these things and lots of other things besides. So Aristotle says, look, there are two different kinds of goods that we seek. One set of goods is, we could call them intrinsic goods. They are good for their own sake. Other things are instrumental. They're goods for the sake of something else. Typically, anyway, desired for the sake of something else. So, um, instruments are instrumentally good. They're valuable, but because they do something, right? They let you achieve some other goal. So, it's easy to think of examples of instrumental goods. What are some examples? Currency. Good. Currency. Money is like this, okay? It's good for what it can get you. It's not good in itself. Um, just stuff your house full of money, but never spend it on anything. It's not really doing anything for you, right? So um, it's an instrumental good. And lots of this piece of chalk is an instrumental good. It's good because of what it can do. It's not like, I just know this piece of chalk. I just carry it for totally. <laughs> No, it's good for what it can do. But there are lots of things we do desire for their own sakes. So what are some examples of that? Yeah? Like physical health, like people that exercise, like you're not really like doing it because it's like chalk that's like right on the floor. It's like you're doing it. Good, good. Health is something people desire. Intrinsically, we desire it for its own sake. Now actually, it's also good for other things, right? I mean, if you're sick, you're not going to be able to do lots of things. So. 
It's something that could also be valued for its instrumental good. But right, it belongs in this intersection. It's really good for its own sake and for the sake of other things. And lots of things are in that intersection. In fact, Aristotle says really almost all intrinsic goods are in that intersection. There are things that we value for their own sake, but also because of other things they can do for us. Some other examples of intrinsic goods, desirable in themselves. We love people. Love, excellent. It's interesting that that isn't in Aristotle's list of these, but later thinkers, Christian thinkers, Stoic thinkers, and others will say, yeah, of course, that's really important to most people's lives. And it's not just because it does other things for you, it's because it's valuable in itself. Other things like that. Humor. Humor, yes. <clears throat> just seeing the humor in things seems valuable for its own sake. You know, somebody says, hey, listen, I... I turn on that comedy show. It makes me laugh. I enjoy it. Somebody says, well, why? Why do you want to laugh? <laughs> right, laugh. And it's like, what do you mean, why do I want to laugh? Um, now, laughter is probably good for you in various ways. But nevertheless, that's not why you value it. You value it for its own sake. The funny seems worthwhile independently of all that. Having a good sense of humor seems worthwhile. OK, so there are lots of things like this. And they tend to be in that category. But now Aristotle says the things that are intrinsic goods, but are always desired for their own sake, never for the sake of something else, those he refers to as final things. Final because really they're chains of actions, uh, of activities and products. And those chains, he thinks, lead us ultimately to the sort of thing that is always valued for its own sake, never for the sake of something else. Well, he says, there's only one thing that's really like that. Namely, happiness, or well-being, or thriving, or flourishing, or living well. That's the one thing, he says, that is always in that category. And if you say, but what about health, and love, and humor, and so on, you say, well, they're there, both of those, and actually, they're part of happiness, too. Could you be happy if you were terribly sick? Could you be happy if you just never found love? You never loved anyone and nobody ever loved you? Some of you are nodding yes. <laughs> uh, there's a behavioral concerns hotline you might want to call. Uh, could you thrive if just nothing ever struck you as funny? Actually, there's a colleague of mine. I've worked with him for 39 years now, and I've never heard him laugh. And that makes me worry about him. Right? <laughs> I was still alive after 39 years of our teaching together, so I was like, apparently this works for him, but still that seems sad. So anyway, yeah, it's something that really does, in a certain sense, include all of those things, I think, as parts of what it is to thrive, to live well. Well, we have to think about this kind of goal, and so far we've been thinking about primarily in terms of individuals, but now think about the whole community. What are we looking for? We want the community to thrive, to flourish as well. But of course, we don't talk about a society as being happy <laughs> in quite the same way um, as we think about an individual. So what does this mean for, well, let's forget humanity as a whole for a moment and just think about this in an organizational context. In our organization, in our business, our club, our university, whatever it is, we're thinking, yeah, we want to thrive. But what would that come to when we think about a, an organization? It's, yeah, it seems like all these things can be argued to be instrumental goods. I feel like they all come out from like an interesting desire to, for continuity. It's like all these things, the reason we aim towards happiness is that is an indicator that what you're doing is going to promote continuity. Does that make sense? Is it, well, it's an indicator that it's what? Um, what is it that it's going to promote continuity? Like we do these things, we like we have we value health and love and humor and happiness intrinsically because they're useful instruments to maintaining social stability and like the continuation of the species. Like if they weren't useful to the society, we wouldn't have them be valuable to us. Like if health and love weren't as valuable to continuity, then we wouldn't have them as intrinsic values. Right, right. Um, Aristotle just asserts. This is the one and only thing like this. <laughs> he doesn't really give us an argument. He says, look, the common people as well as the experts all agree that it's happiness. And you might think, well, wait a minute. 
<laughs> is it really happiness? There are several other things that people fill in here, and you've got one of them. You could say, wait a minute, maybe it's evolutionary success, maybe it's the sur survival and thriving of the species. Or maybe, if you're a religious thinker, you might think, actually, what we're striving for is something like a union with God, um, or something that transcends this worldly conception of happiness and involves some kind of divine vision or heaven or I mean, you might characterize this religious goal in various ways, enlightenment in a lot of Eastern traditions, but you might want to say, no, it's not happiness, it's communion with God or enlightenment or the beatific vision or evolutionary success or whatever then you might fill in here. And then happiness, you would say, of you know, an individual is really at best kind of a, a means to that. And so far, Aristotle's given us no no argument that it's this and nothing else. Um, certainly not against those kinds of alternatives, but really no argument that there can't be other things too. Yeah? Could you, like, because he was talking about, like, it being instrumental for continuity, could you, like, break down happiness even, like, more reductionist to, like, the level of existence? Like, Aristotle in the metaphysics talks about, like, a free man and, like, existing for his own sake, not for the sake of another. And that's like right. even more rudimentary than happiness, and like even like being free, because animals you wouldn't say are free, like they're kind of bound by their. Uh, yeah. And humans, like we're free, and that's like not necessary for continuity at all. But yet, yeah, that seems to be something different. So, could you argue that it's like our existence and that like power of volition that we have that makes us like have intrinsic good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think Kant does something very much like that, thinking, wait a minute, it's um, something like freedom, autonomy, something like the ability to establish our own goals and live for our own sake, treat our lives as worthy of their own, for, in themselves. That's really what should go in here. Um, in one sense, those are competitors to what Aristotle was saying. In another sense, I think you could see them as ways of spelling out well-being or flourishing. Uh, if you have that religious vision, for example, you would say, well, have you really flourish if you have not attained union with the divine, if you have not attained enlightenment? Um, if you take the evolutionary account, have you really been fulfilled, have you really flourished if you, in fact, did not contribute to the evolutionary success of the species? And, and so on with yours. If you have not been autonomous, if you have not been able to establish your own goals and live life for its own sake as opposed to meeting someone else's requirements, have you actually flourished? Have you actually been led a thriving life? So I think he would basically try to swallow up all of these alternatives in his conception of happiness. Say, well, maybe happiness does involve things that happen after we die. Maybe happiness does involve something involving the larger species. Maybe happiness does involve liberty or freedom or autonomy in some fundamental way. And and so I think his response to all these would be to just try to swallow them up more than try to refute them, say that must be part of well-being then too. Okay, well, enough on this. I do want to think a little bit about another question, which is, you might say, how do we know what we're doing when we try to develop virtues? We've looked at an attempt to define virtue in the early Platonic dialogues and then in his middle period. But there's a different kind of question that Aristotle wants to address. Because he says, look, take something like ambition. You can be too much striving for achievement, too much striving for power and glory for its own sake. But you can also be unambitious. Somewhere in between is the right attitude. And he says, that's the way it is in general for these. The whole idea, in a sense, is that virtue is a mean. It is a mean between extremes. So virtues typically have this sort of structure. We have a vice. <laughs> the virtue is in between. That vice, vice one, and vice two on the other side. And what we have to do in finding the virtue is figure out what is the mean between these extremes. We don't want to be so ambitious that we feel like we're just striving for power for its own sake, but we don't want to be unambitious. We want to strive for accomplishment. Um, and other things are like that too. So 
It's interesting, he says, well, ordinarily, we have the conception that there's one opposite to a virtue, like honesty. What's the opposite of honesty? Dishonesty. Dishonesty. But he says, actually, that's because we're more drawn. We think of just those two. So honesty would be this, dishonesty would be this. But how? Is there something that's the opposite extreme? Yeah. Maybe if you're like Kant and you believe that you should never lie, ever, even if it protects someone else. Good, good. Suppose you never lie. Can you be too honest? Is one way of putting the question. Now, Aristotle said it's misleading because honesty is a virtue. Um, but nevertheless, though, you get the idea. Tell the truth where you shouldn't be telling the truth. Uh, yeah, Kant's example is one, okay? The murderer comes to the door looking for the victim. Do you tell him where he is? The answer is supposed to be no, I think. <laughs> but Kant would say yes. That's too much honesty. But there are other situations where people could be too honest. Yeah. You know, like if your girlfriend has an outfit that you don't like. Why is that everybody's favorite example? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's true. No, this uh, yeah, this happened to me just the other day. <laughs> well, so how, how's this look? It's like awful. They don't go together at all, right? I mean, it's just like, no, this is dreadful. Um, and of course, I'm a virtuous guy. So, oh, that's right. <laughs> uh, that may be too honest. Um, yeah, other examples. If you're a general and you have your army and you decide, well, I don't want to be deceitful, so you just, instead of using some clever tactic, you just run at them and die, that's. Ah, okay, good. Um, <laughs> Sun Tzu says that deceit is the heart of warfare. But suppose you think, well, I can't be deceitful. I must be honest. So, so indeed, I can't do any maneuvers that would trick the enemy. I must let the enemy know what I'm doing. And if the news reporter comes over and says, so General, what's the plan for this attack? Gotta tell. And so on and so forth. You might think, no, this is a recipe for disaster, right? Um, other examples. You're yeah. playing poker and you get dealt, and the first thing you say, pocket tens. Like, that's not. That's, <laughs> that's right, you're playing poker. The whole game is in a way deceiving the other people, right? Yeah. I mean, if you just say, oh, look what I have, uh, you're, you're going to be in trouble. So, so, yeah, you can be too honest. Um, he refers to that as being blunt. <laughs> Bluntness. Uh, but it's, I, I mean, it's broader than that, as we can see. It's like, yeah, telling the truth when you really shouldn't tell. Um, I've been guilty of this occasionally, and not just with my wife. Uh, there, I hesitate to tell you this, but a student submitted a paper one time, and it was so bad. <laughs> it was so bad that I thought it was a joke. I just assumed it was a joke, and that the person needed more time and turned this in as a joke. Um, it was supposed to be a Russell's theory of definite descriptions. And it just went off about the weather and stuff. It was, I mean, it's like, this is, okay, very funny, right? But uh, I, I thought he was just kidding. And I was trying to respond in a, a humorous fashion. And so I did it with just a link to the video clip from Billy Madison. It said, I award you no points. Everyone in this room is now <laughs> dumber for having heard <laughs> May God have mercy on your soul. And the poor guy was really upset. What a joke! <laughs> I thought it was sort of this silly way of asking for an extension. It wasn't. It felt terrible. Uh, but anyway, that was an example of <laughs> too much bluntness. Okay. Uh, I didn't think I was being too blunt. I thought I was being funny, and he was being funny. And yeah, be careful. Maybe people didn't intend that as a joke. Uh, yeah. Another way I think of it is um, excessive transparency. See? So too much information when... Oh, that's another example. Yes, exactly. Hey, how you doing? Well, let me tell you, I got up on bed. I, I wasn't feeling that great, so I went downstairs and had a cup of coffee. It wasn't that good. So I got some heavy cup. And then I, you know, I, I poured myself some milk, but then my girlfriend came in and started talking to me, and the girl got soggy. And it's like, I don't even know this, okay? I just went, you're supposed to respond, hey, okay, right? I, and so, yeah, that kind of too much information is also a way of going wrong here. Well, they're all like this, okay? Generosity is a virtue that distresses. 
And normally we think of the opposite of generosity as something like stinginess. But then, can you be too generous? Can you give away too much? Can you be too kind? Yeah. Sure, right? I mean, example. Say it again. The yeah, 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 good. Good. So there are situations like this where you say, um, yeah, you're supposed to help other people, but uh, there are limits on that, right? The person on the street corner asks you for a dollar. It's generous to give them a dollar. If you just say, hey, here's the key to my car and my house and stuff, take it. It feels like you can't. No, that's, <laughs> that's not a strength of character, okay? So you can be indulgent. <clears throat> what about courage? We think of cowardice as the ordinary opposite of courage. But can you, in effect, be too courageous? Um, yeah, you can become rashness. Now, if you look at what Aristotle has to say about rashness and courage and so on, it's actually very interesting, and it suggests that not all virtues and vices fit this simple model. This works for things that are one-dimensional, but actually courage, he thinks, is not one-dimensional. Because what's going on here? Well, I think in the background, we've got Plato's model. We have reason, we have desire, and desires of various kinds, and then motion. And as we saw last for Aristotle, there are really many different motions, many different desires we have to think about. <laughs> uh, and so good, different virtues will be involved in controlling those desires and controlling those emotions. And they are, to some extent, independent from one another, unlike in Plato. But the idea is supposed to be, well, OK, good. Um, in many cases, there is one desire, like here, keeping things for ourselves, as opposed to helping others, or here, telling the truth, or you know, protecting ourselves, or whatever. But when you start thinking, actually, already, you realize there are lots of reasons people lie, so already we can worry is just one thing here. But with courage, he's confident there are two different things. There is fear, but there's also confidence. So two different ways of being rash. You could be too confident, or you could not have enough fear. And those are two different forms of rashness, you might say. In one case, you just don't feel enough fear. The person says, hey, want to jump off the bridge? It sounds fun. And in the other case, you're just too confident. You're like, oh, pretty, pretty risky, but but a great swimmer, no problem. OK? Those are two different things. To take the battle scenario, one is like, yeah, nothing killed me. I'm not going to die. And the other is more like, well, you know, I can beat those guys. In the first case, you're just not afraid. In the second case, you're like, yeah, I'm afraid of them. But, you know, how can we lose, man? And those are two different ways of doing it. And so, really, the picture for courage is this two dimensional thing. And the person who has too much fear and too little confidence is a coward. The person who has too little fear or too much confidence then is rash. Uh, courage is something like the center of all of that, but there are different ways of failing. You might be just too fearful. You might just lack confidence. You might have too much, too little fear. You might have too much confidence. And so when you start thinking it that way, you realize, wait, some of these virtues are going to actually pertain to more than one set of desires or emotions, and so be it somewhat more complicated. Well, that at this point, I want to move into the discussion of positive psychology. Because last time we were talking about cardinal virtues, and according to Peterson, Seligman, and a variety of other positive psychologists, those are also fundamental core virtues. And why? Well, you can say, look, well, it is really important to control desires. So temperance, moderation, self-control. That really is a fundamental kind of virtue. And then, as Aristotle says, it might split into many kinds. There is controlling one's desire for food, 
controlling one's desire for sex, controlling one's desire for uh, maybe material goods, and so on and so forth. Then the control of emotions, well, that's sort of a different thing. There, the term is courage or fortitude, but it involves control of one's emotions more broadly. And again, if there are many emotions, there might be many forms of this. The control of fear specifically feels like courage, but other kinds of control are relevant here too. And then there are the intellectual virtues, as Aristotle puts it, especially wisdom, which is just a virtue of reason and being able to figure out what to do. But now what else? Well, Plato had that idea of justice as a question of how those things relate, the being in proper balance, each doing its own task. But Aristotle, uh, I think, has a different conception of justice, partly because that question of justice in the soul, I think, makes little sense to most of us. Um, give me a situation that is just blatantly unjust, real or imagined. Yes, apartheid. Good, apartheid. Now, is that something that one person can do on their own? I'm going to have a regime within the software. <laughs> <laughs> Where the white part of me and the black part of me cannot interact. Well, it's like, wait, what? That doesn't make any sense, right? Even if I were mixed race, that wouldn't make any sense. I mean, I'm a mixture of other things. I have to say, so the German part of me and the Serbian part of me. <laughs> like, what's that? That doesn't make any sense. And so you might think, yeah, wait, that, no, that doesn't work. Uh, that's something that involves interactions among people. And in fact, insofar as you think of these as parts of the self, you realize, wait a minute, there's something hugely wrong with all of this. After all, we were concerned with, well, social things, right? Ethics is supposed to be part of how we get along together. It's supposed to be relevant to community and part of a question of how I treat you. It's not just this internal thing. I mean, can, can I say I am virtuous because the parts of my soul are very bad? Of course, but tell schmuck to everyone around me. <laughs> no, I write it has to do with how I behave toward other people. And so you might say, yeah, all of this is within the self, and that's all fine. But now, we have these other people out here, okay? And we've got individual people I interact with, but then we've got my interaction with, you might say, the whole. And then, of course, all this is embedded in the universe itself. And so all of this is part of my connection to the world as a whole. So we need something else, which is just like everything else, nature or the universe, maybe, you should say, really. After all, I am a person, but who relates to other people as individuals, who is part of a social group, and is part of a universe. Now, build that in, and you realize, okay, we not only have wisdom and courage and self-control, but we have the virtues that are involved in proper relations to other individual people. Okay? We have the virtues that are involved in my relation to my community, a civic virtue. And then we have my relations to the universe as a whole. So the way a variety of positive psychologists categorize it, justice is really the primary civic virtue. Um, apartheid, notice, was a social system. It wasn't a question of just how one person treated another, though we could add injustice there too. It's really an unjust social system. It was something about the civic character, about the relation among the members of society at large that was unjust. To talk, for us, to talk about justice in the soul or injustice in the soul feels weird. At best, some kind of metaphor. Justice is something that happens in communities. But then, there's also a question of our relationship to individual people. And so we might think in terms of love, there, for example, or kindness, or generosity. Maybe generosity really belongs there. After all, generosity 
could be a control of selfishness, but in another sense, it feels like, look, it has to do with how I relate to other people. And then the last category is what they refer to as the transcendent virtues. The ones that involve my relationship to the universe as a whole and that give my life meaning. So what are some examples of these? Well, under the heading of self-control, we not only have things like temperance and moderation and so on, but we have maybe chastity or the reasonable pursuit of health, whatever we would call that. Um, and so kind of prudence and so forth. Under control of emotions, we would have, you know, being uh, gentle or good-tempered, so control of anger. We would have someone who is um, sort of emotionally stable. A lot of psychological health would look like control of emotions. Here we have not only wisdom, but things like intelligence, curiosity. Here we have things like love, kindness, generosity, respect toward others. Here. Civic virtues, not only justice, but you know, you might say being a good citizen uh, in a broad sense. Uh, then here, transcendent things, all sorts of things get swept into that, okay? Kind of spirituality. Um, if this is love, this is where faith and hope go. <laughs> okay, there are these transcendent things that do my relation to the universe. Humor also goes there, according to the positive psychologists. It has something to do with my relation to the universe. If I have a good sense of humor, it's not just internal. It's not just a matter of how I relate to my society or individuals. It's something about the way I perceive meaning in the world. The person I mentioned that I've never heard laugh, I actually find it difficult to talk to that person because when I'm around somebody that serious, I just always want to make jokes. <laughs> yeah. It's like, this is too heavy, i got to lighten the mood. So I start making jokes. And he never gets them. You know, I'll say something funny. I think it's funny. And his response is always, well, but as if I'm making a serious <laughs> It's very disturbing because I'll think that was a clever remark. It was satisfied, self satisfied way. And then it's like, oh, maybe it wasn't. I don't know. Um, it's very weird. I find the people I get along with. Best, just laugh at my jokes. That's, that's the main criteria of friendship for me. Yeah, laugh at my jokes. Anyway, so the thought is those are all important. There are six main cardinal virtues, if you want to think of it that way, according to these psychologists. Now, some other psychologists have divided up the sphere of virtues differently, and so sometimes there are a few more, sometimes a few less. Uh, if you look at various traditions, all of these figure in. The transcendent occasionally seem to be missing, uh, but otherwise, these seem pretty, pretty universal. Now, not entirely universal, but almost universal. They seem to be evolutionary, the advantageous, that's one way of looking at it. They seem to be conducive to individuals' happiness. But the last thing I want to mention that's highly relevant to organizational ethics is that some of them are highly relevant to the health and success of organizations. And so one of the articles that I collected for you is about that. Which of these are most central to organizations? If you are going to hire someone, for example, or admit them to your club, or admit them to your university, or whatever it is, what's the most important thing to look for? And actually, they think it's also the same thing that you're going to look for most in a romantic partner or in a friend. Okay, what are the things that are most important? Well, now, sometimes, given the purposes of your organization, some specific thing might be higher up. Military unit, courage is pretty important. You're, you're signing people up for the United States Marines, they have to remain cool under fire. And that matters in a way that doesn't matter in an ordinary organization. We don't say, all right, we're giving you an in interview for the philosophy department. Um, we're going to shoot bullets over your head. And see if you freak out. <laughs> uh, be interesting, but no, we don't do that. Uh, however, there are some things that seem universally important. What are some? Intelligence. Okay, good. Intelligence, wisdom. That seems really important. You gotta have good judgment more broadly. Another that turns out to be surprisingly important is hope. One of these transcendent virtues. 
Whether somebody is hopeful toward the future is actually the best predictor of whether they will stay at the university, whether they will stay in the company, whether they will stay in the Marine Corps, <laughs> or whatever. Matters a lot more to than most other things. Also, kindness, treating other people with respect, those are fundamental things. And if we want something that is a good proxy for the whole thing, you know what's the best thing? Anyway, the result of this research is you want to hire somebody who's going to be good, effective, to stay with you for a long time. Look for somebody who's happy. If they're happy, gosh, I have so many thoughts. It's a happy wife, happy, happy life. But it's more like happy person, happy organization. Okay? <laughs> um, they're going to be more productive, they're going to work there longer, they're going to be happier, they're going to promote positive goals. They are just going, it will be a better organization. So organizations with happy people who are hopeful, who care about other people, who are wise, that's really what you want to look for at the level. 